title of my sermon this morning is, What is the Gospel? What is the Gospel? Now, the word gospel itself is used in the New Testament 104 times. It's only used in the New Testament. It's not used in the Old Testament. But what does that word mean? Well, if you would, flip over, keep your finger there in Isaiah and actually get to Isaiah 61. But then flip over to Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament. So put one finger in Isaiah 61 and then go over to Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament. Now, in, in, in most languages, the word gospel sounds something along the lines of German is evangelium or Spanish, evangelio. You know, most languages, it's something like that. And the word gospel itself, if you break it down, the English components comes from Old English, meaning good message. Okay, the, those two aspects of the goo spell right there, if you were to go back to Old English. But the gospel simply means the good news or the glad tidings or, or a good report or a good message. The Bible says, if you would look there in verse 18 of Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now flip back to Isaiah 61 verse 1 and we'll find the quotation that Jesus is referring to. And it says there, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So notice how in Luke chapter 4 it said, I'm anointed to preach the gospel. And in Isaiah it says, I'm anointed to bring glad tidings. And tidings is just an old way of saying news. Tidings are news, okay? Now flip over if you would to Romans chapter 10 and then put a finger in Isaiah 52. I'm going to show you another comparison like that. So we're letting the Bible define itself by comparing Scripture with Scripture and seeing that the Bible will use gospel and glad tidings or good news interchangeably. Romans chapter 10, 13, and then we're going to go to Isaiah 52. It says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they believe in him? I'm sorry, I misread that. Let me start over. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? And we're going to look at where that's written. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, with your finger still there, go back to Isaiah 52 verse 7. And let's look up that as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. So again, the good tidings of Isaiah 52 become the gospel of Romans chapter 10. Then if you look back at Romans chapter 10, right after it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The next verse says, but they've not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. And then of course, look at Isaiah 53 verse one. And it says, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. So in verse number 15, he's quoting Isaiah 52. And then in verse number 16, he's quoting Isaiah 53. And he's talking about the gospel. When it says, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The report that is not being believed or being believed is the gospel. And he goes on to explain in Isaiah 53 what that gospel is because he says in verse number five of Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, we are healed. The thing that I really want to point out here are the personal pronouns that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, 
we are healed. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for us. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save us. The good news is that salvation is available to us. Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. As you're going there, I'll finish in Isaiah 53. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What does the word gospel mean? It simply means the good news, the glad tidings. And it has to do with Jesus Christ coming into this world to save us. His death, his burial, his resurrection, etc. Now, most preachers, though, that are independent fundamental Baptists, they'll kind of make an error on this. And this is very common amongst independent fundamental Baptists to try to limit the gospel to only meaning the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So they'll have a very narrow definition of what the gospel is by saying the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, yes, the death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel, but what I want to show you this morning is that there's more to the gospel than that. The gospel is broader than that. It's not just the death, burial, and resurrection. And it's a mistake to only define it as just the death, burial, and resurrection. I'm going to prove that, and I'm going to show you why that's, that's a little dangerous to limit it to that. It's an error. I don't think it's that common of an error, but it's a common error amongst independent fundamental Baptists for some reason. You know, you look it up in the dictionary, and the dictionary says that the gospel, uh, I went to dictionary.com, which is my favorite dictionary. It said, gospel is the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, the Christian revelation. And then the secondary definition was the story of Christ's life and teaching. That's actually an accurate definition of what the gospel is from the Bible I'm going to show you. Now, of course, it includes the death, burial, and resurrection. And, of course, the death, burial, and res resurrection is really the pivotal part of the gospel. It's really the crux of the gospel, no pun intended. But it's not all there is to the The whole thing's the gospel. And I'm going to prove that. But look down at your Bible there in 1 Corinthians 15. This is where they're getting their definition, which is a good definition, but it's too limited. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So, of course, we are saved by what? The gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain? It means to believe the wrong stuff. You know, some people say, well, believing's not enough to save you because you can believe in vain. No, you believe in vain when you believe the wrong thing. You know, if you don't, you don't even keep in memory what Paul even preached, you don't even remember what the message was, but you believed something, well, sorry, you got to believe the right stuff. you got to believe the gospel. But he says, I delivered unto you, verse 3, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So he says, I preached the gospel to you by which you're saved, and then he says, well, here's what I preached unto you. I preached that Jesus died, that he buried, that he was buried, and that he rose again. So that's where they're getting that definition for the gospel, which that's true. That is preaching the gospel when you preach that, but there's more to it than that. Let me prove it to you. But before I do, let me just show you a key component here of the gospel that Paul gives. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. So it's not just that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. It's that he died for us and was buried and rose again. That's what makes it good news is when it's applicable to us. Because, I mean, what, what's a good news? Well, the good news is Jesus died. The bad news is it wasn't for you. That wouldn't be good news at all to me, right? So the gospel is that he died for us. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. But there's more to the gospel. Let me prove it to you. Are you in Mark chapter 1? Did I tell you to turn there? Mark chapter number 1, the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter number 1, and I submit to you that when we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the four gospels, that is a great name for those books. It's a great name to call it the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke. The gospel of John. And let me just show you that it's not just the death, burial, and resurrection. Because look at verse 1 of chapter 1 of Mark. It says the beginning 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, he's not going to die in this chapter. He's not going to be buried in this chapter, nor is he going to rise again in this chapter. But this is the beginning of the gospel. Why? Because the entire story is the gospel. The entire uh, story of Jesus coming to earth, being born, living a sinless life, preaching the word of God, all of his preaching, his ministry, his, yes, his death, yes, his burial, his resurrection, his second coming, it's all the gospel. It's all the, the message of salvation and from start to finish. So that's why even in the Old Testament, scriptures that don't explicitly bring up the resurrection or explicitly even bring up uh, his burial or the death, they could still be giving us the gospel just by telling us that there's a Savior coming into the world. That's part of the good news for us, that the Savior's coming. Go, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. I'll prove it to you further. Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to show you why this is important in, in a moment, to understand that the gospel is not only just referring to that one aspect <clears throat> of the death, burial, and resurrection, although <clears throat> that is the key component. <clears throat> Go to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for I bring you, what? Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you, notice that key phrase coming up again, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, is he preaching the death, burial, and resurrection here? No. But he's bringing them great news. Hey, great news. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Now you say, why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because when people try to narrow the definition of the gospel to just meaning only the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then here's what they'll say. Oh, this is a different gospel. And then they'll try to tell you there's multiple gospels and different people are preaching different gospels and different dispensations. No, there's only one gospel for mankind, and that is Jesus Christ is our Savior. And everything that goes into that story, everything that, that tells us about Jesus Christ's redemptive work and whether it's his incarnation, his birth, his ministry, everything that went into saving us is all the gospel. Okay. So error number one is by, you know, wrongfully limiting the gospel to say that's only talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. Well, if you look up 104 mentions of it, you'll see that many times it's referring to other aspects of Christ's ministry. But number two, here's another major error, saying that the gospel is only available to certain people. Now, I've even heard Calvinists make this ridiculous statement. They say this. I, I had one uh, message me with this even two days ago. They said, Calvinism is the gospel. Who's ever heard somebody say, Calvinism is the gospel? Yeah, a few hands went up. They'll make this, stupid, the, this stupidity of just, well, Calvinism is the gospel. Wrong because the gospel is for all people. The Bible said right here, I'm bringing you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people at the end of verse 10. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You see, the gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not that he just loved certain people and sent his son to save a select few. No, no, no. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in, in uh, John 3, 16 there. Now, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. See, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's goal is to save whosoever will. But it's up to us whether we get saved or not, because we have to believe or not believe. And if we believe on Christ, we'll be saved. And if we don't believe, we'll be damned. But God's will is that all men would be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, do all men get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? No, but that's not his fault. His will is for people to be saved. 
but people have their own free will to accept or reject the free gift. Now, I submit to you that not only is it stupid to say Calvinism is the gospel, let me submit to you that it's impossible for a Calvinist to even preach the gospel. And let me explain to you why. And if you don't know what Calvinism is, it's named after a guy named John Calvin, who is a Protestant reformer who taught a hardcore predestination doctrine. And what I mean by that is that he taught that it's already predetermined who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell, and that we have no choice, we have no say in the matter, but that, you know, people are just going to be saved if God chose them. And people that God didn't choose, they can't be saved no matter what. They never had a chance. Okay. And later on, there was an acronym that his followers came up with called TULIP to describe what they believe. And one of the things in TULIP, the L in TULIP, is called limited atonement. So what Calvinists believe is that Jesus Christ did not die for everybody. When they say limited atonement, they say that Christ's atonement on the cross, when he died for us, it wasn't for everybody. It was only for the people who get saved. So he didn't die for the whole world. Well, that's garbage because the Bible makes it crystal clear that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And the Bible says that he tasted death for every man. And he loved the world and died for the world that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so this thing of limited atonement is really the worst aspect of Calvinism. But this is what Calvinists believe, that Jesus didn't die for everybody and that we have no uh, decision to make, we have no free will. So here's why I say it's impossible for a Calvinist to preach the gospel is because the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. How can a Calvinist preach that? How can a, and let me just illustrate it this way. Let me just bring you up here as an example. Let's say, you know, this is, let's say I've never met Brother Juarez in my life, right? And I just, I just walk up to him, just a random person. Can I pre, if I'm a Calvinist, can I preach him the gospel? Can I say to you, listen, hey, Christ died for our sins. According to, I got good news for you. Christ died for us. He was buried. He rose again. He did it for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are here. Can I really say that to him? No, I can't even preach the gospel. Because that's the good news. Yeah. Is that Jesus died for him. Yeah. But let's say I reject the stupidity of Calvinism. And I believe what the Bible says, that Jesus really did die for everybody. I can say, hey, Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. But, you know, in order for you to be saved, you've got to believe that. You've got to reach out and take that free gift. You've got to look to Jesus now and live. Go ahead and have a seat. So, you see how a Calvinist can't even really preach the gospel? Because the key component of the gospel is that he did it for us. Whether it's the angels announcing it in that field to the shepherds and they say, hey, this is glad tidings that'll be to all people. Whether it's John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Whether it's Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. Or whether we're in 1 Corinthians 15 itself where it says that he died for our sins. It's always for us. The gospel, the good news is that he did it for me. He did it for you. If he did it for someone else, that's bad news. That's not good news at all. The good news is for everybody. So in order to preach the gospel, it has to be applicable unto us. That's the key component there. So error number one is when people try to limit the definition of gospel to just being the death, burial, and resurrection, when really the whole story is the gospel. All of Christ's ministry is the gospel. Okay. Number two, the error is to say that the gospel is only available for certain people. And this kind of lead, error number one kind of leads us to error number three, where people teach that a works-based religion is preaching the gospel. Now, if you get a wrong definition of gospel, then you would even think that works-based salvation uh, religions are teaching the gospel. Because if you're going to say, well, the, the gospel is just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, well, is that, don't the Catholics teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? But are they preaching the gospel? Well, let's find out. Let's turn our Bibles to Galatians chapter 1 and let's see if the Roman Catholics are teaching the gospel because they're certainly teaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
Let's see if the Orthodox Church is teaching the gospel. They believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. Let's find out, okay? Because actually, no, I submit to you, and I'm going to prove this from the Bible, that a works-based religion is not teaching the gospel. They're not bringing the good news. The Catholic Church today and the Orthodox Church, they're not bringing good news. They're not bringing the gospel. Now, they're bringing another gospel, but they're not bringing the gospel of Christ. And let me prove it to you. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So why does he say it's another, but it's not another? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, this is another gospel. But when he says it's not another, he's saying it's not a completely different gospel. It's a twisted version of the original gospel. He's saying it's not another, but there be some among you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's not like the devil went back to the drawing board and came up with a brand new gospel. What he did is he took Christ's gospel and he perverted it. And what does perversion mean? Twisting. To pervert something means to twist it, okay? So he's saying here that this other gospel, which is not good news, it's a perversion or a twisting of the true gospel. But though we, verse 8, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So here's the big question. Because in chapter 1, he doesn't really go into detail on what the twisting is, does he? He just says, look, people are twisting the gospel. People are perverting the gospel. And once they've perverted it and tweaked it in this way, it's no longer the gospel. It's another gospel now. It's something totally different now. But he doesn't go into detail in chapter 1, what is the tweaking? What is the twisting? But the whole rest of the book of Galatians tells us what it is that's being ruined about the gospel. Let's go to chapter 3, for example, verse 1. He says in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, we're, we're going to see what's the problem with the Galatians. What's the problem with this other gospel that they've embraced? Is it, is it that they're saying Jesus didn't die on the cross? Is that what they're saying? Are they saying he wasn't really buried? Are they saying that he didn't actually rise from the dead? No, actually, they're, they're not saying any of those things. But yet they've departed from the gospel. So if the gospel is just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then how could he say it's another gospel when they have that part? Here's what they've twisted and ruined it. It says in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Now, what does he mean by that? It's saying, look, this is the only thing I want to talk about. So this is apparently the big issue. And in fact, if you read Galatians, this is the same issue he hammers in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. It keeps coming up. He says, This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So what's the choice here? Is it works or is it faith? He says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you with the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. He preached before the gospel unto Abraham, it says. He preached before the gospel unto Abraham. And what did he say when he preached him the gospel? In thee shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. How many times did he just bring up faith? Look at that. He said in verse 2, the hearing of faith. He said in verse number 5, uh, the hearing of faith at the end of the verse. He said in verse 6, Abraham believed God. Verse 7, they which are of faith are the children of Abraham. Verse 8, uh, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Verse 9, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. 
Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Look, it's faith, 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 faith. And if it's the works of the law, you're cursed. If you're preaching another gospel, you're cursed. What? Because the, guess what the other gospel is? The other gospel is salvation by the law, salvation by works, as opposed to salvation by faith. True gospel, salvation by faith. Another gospel, false gospel, cursed, wicked, witchcraft gospel is works-based. So can we look at a, at a religion that's teaching work salvation and say, well, at least they're teaching the gospel. I mean, at least they're preaching the gospel. Even though they got salvation wrong, they're still giving people the gospel by telling them that he died and was buried and rose again. No, that's not the gospel. Because the gospel is that he died for our sins and that he brings salvation through his work, not through our work. How is it good news that if you kiss your icons enough and cross yourself enough and get sprinkled with enough holy water and go to church enough and do works enough and get catechized and confirmed enough and go through all, how is that good news that if you do all that and repent of your sins and stop sinning and live right and follow the commandments and obey God and love God enough and eat enough crackers and drink enough wine, you know, you might make it. Amen. That's not good news. That's the worst news I've heard all day. The good news is that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. It said Jesus died for us. That he died for us. We don't have to do the redemptive work of salvation. He did it. It's done. And he did it for us. And it's applicable to us. And it's able to be received by us. All we have to do is just reach out and take it. All we have to do is confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and we shall be saved. That's good news. That it's a free gift of salvation. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What's he saying there? He's saying, look, if you think you're justified by obeying the Bible, by keeping God's law, by keeping the rules, by doing the thou shalts and abstaining from the thou shalt nots, he's saying, okay, well, then you're going to have to do everything. Because James chapter 2, verse 10 says, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. He's guilty of all. So you could keep every law of God perfectly, one mistake. Oh, you're guilty of all. I'm doomed. All those years of obeying down the drain. Of course, that's ridiculous because nobody can go years without making a mistake anyway. But the Bible says in verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. You know, there's no wondering about it. It's, it's right there. It's evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. You say, well, but when you have faith, you know, it makes you do the works. Everybody who has faith does the works. You know, they, they go hand in hand. They're inseparable. Well, if they're inseparable, then, then why did God say faith without works is dead? It must be possible to have faith without works. And if it's impossible to separate them, then why did it say in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteous, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. He said in Romans 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that you can be saved, you can be justified without works. You can believe and work not and you'll still be saved. Look, 1 Corinthians 3 teaches that you can get to heaven and all your works are wood, hay, and stubble. All your works are burned up and you get no reward, but he himself shall be saved. You can still be saved and all your works are just wood, hay, and stubble. Now, if you did any, any good stuff, any eternal value stuff, then that'll be gold, silver, and precious stones. It'll make it through the fire and you will receive a reward. But if you only live a life of wood, hay, and stubble, you're going to lose your reward. But it says, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So you can still be saved. Why? Because salvation is not by works, it's by faith. And the Bible says the law is not of faith. 
So you can't sit there and say, oh, well, if you have the faith, then yeah, you'll do the work. You know, law and faith are like the same thing, you know, and works and grace are like the same thing. No, they're not the same thing. They couldn't be any more different. Because the Bible says, if it be of grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. To him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It says in verse 12, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us, verse 13, from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What's the gospel? The gospel is that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Isn't that good news? That curse of the law that said, Cursed be he that continueth not in all the words of the book of the law to do them. And you're like, oh man, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm going to get all this done. How am I going to be able to continue in all the words of the book of law to do them my entire life? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Notice those pronouns, for us. He did it for us. He took our place. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. If you would, flip over to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I have a lot more here in Galatians, but, you know, we, we don't have time to just read the whole book of Galatians. But I encourage you to go home and read the whole book of Galatians. Because in chapter 2, this is going to be hammered. In chapter 3, in chapter 4, in chapter 5, I mean, it's just, it's what the whole book of Galatians is about. I remember as a teenager just reading the book of Galatians for the first time and just thinking, how can anybody believe in a works-based salvation after reading the book of Galatians? You know, I mean, Galatians more than any other book. And, and, and Romans, good night. How can you read Romans and walk away with a works? Yeah, they don't read it, exactly. <laughs> if they, you know, or, or they read it blindfolded. Because the Bible says that the unbelievers, especially the Jews, they have the veil over their eyes when they read the Bible. It, it goes right over their head. They don't get it. We understand it. We have that childlike faith. Every child understands receiving a gift. They don't get confused on Christmas morning saying, like, wait, whoa, wait, can you explain this to me one more time? <laughs> wait, this stuff is for me and I don't have to pay for it? Surely there's a mistake. You know, uh, let, me, let, me, let me write you a check. No, every child just does what? Mine rips it open. You know, you know we, need to, we need to become as little children to enter into the kingdom of God and understand that mom and dad paid it all. Jesus paid it all. That's the illustration. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of of his glory. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. I'm just going to show you a couple other interesting verses that use the word gospel. Like I said, there are 104 mentions of it. We don't have time to go through them all. There are a lot of verses where uh, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You know, the gospel of the kingdom. And, and people say, oh, that was a different gospel for a different dispensation. That was only for the Jews and blah, blah, blah. No, it, it's all part of the same plan. You know, the gospel plan was set in motion in Genesis chapter 3. But really, he already promised us eternal life before the world even began. But it's already set in motion in Genesis 3 when he says that he will send the seed of the woman to bruise the serpent's head. And all throughout the Old Testament, everything's pointing us toward Christ. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive, receive remission of sins. So everything in the Old Testament is pointing us to what? How Christ is going to come to this earth. And sometimes they just give one glimpse of it. They don't go into all the detail in the prophets. But whether you're reading Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, 
whether you're reading Genesis, you get different aspects of the gospel, but the, just the fact that he's coming is considered the gospel. The fact that he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth and reign for a thousand years, that's the gospel. I mean, to me, it's good news that the Lord himself is going to live among us and dwell among us and reign over us and, and set up a perfect government and a perfect kingdom. It's the gospel that we're going to heaven. It's the gospel that we're saved by faith. It's the gospel that we're saved by grace. It's the gospel that Jesus was even born. That's the gospel. It's all part of the gospel because the gospel is the whole message, the whole story. That's why we can look at the book of Matthew and call it the gospel of Matthew and not say, well, the gospel doesn't really start until you get to verse 20, chapter 27. No, because verse 1 of chapter 1 of Mark says the beginning of the gospel. The gospel starts in chapter 1. It's all the gospel, amen? amen? Now, what's the part that saves us? The part that saves us is, yeah, we have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But here's the thing. It's not enough just to believe that the death, burial, and resurrection happened. We also have to trust in that to save us. Because if we're teaching works-based, we're, we're doing what now? Preaching another gospel. So you could have the same death, same burial, same resurrection, and be preaching a different gospel. How? It, when you add works, instead of teaching that it's faith alone. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says this, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, how can any of that that we just read be according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, if the gospel is just only limited to just the death, burial, and resurrection? What does that have to do with being a... Uh, a men stealer. What does that have to do with the law being not? Because, why? Because everything about Christ's message, everything about the teachings of Christ and the apostles, it's all under the blanket umbrella of the gospel. And not only did Christ die on the cross in order to get us to heaven, but he also died on the cross to deliver us from our sins. Because actually, when we get to heaven, we're never going to sin again. I mean, once this body dies, I'm never going to sin again. I mean, that's great news. That's good news. You know, it's not just that God saves us by giving us a home in heaven and giving us escape from hell, but he's also going to change us. And in fact, part of us already is changed, right? Our soul and spirit is regenerated. It's renewed. We have the inward man, the new man living inside of us that's perfect. That's good news. That's a blessing. That allows us to walk in the Spirit and, and do good things and do right things and please God. Look, they that are in the flesh can't please God, but we can please God. That's good news. That we, I mean, isn't it great to be able to do things to please God? You know, I've noticed that human beings, especially men, they seem to have a strong desire to make their dad proud of them. Have you noticed that about people? They really care uh, what their dad thinks or they really want dad to be proud of them, right? Well, how would you like to be a child or even an adult where nothing that you did ever made dad happy? You wouldn't like that very much. Wouldn't you be miserable if no matter how well you did, no matter what you achieved, no matter what you uh, accomplished, dad just, it was never good enough for dad. And you know, you hear about people having daddy issues because dad isn't happy with them. Who knows what I'm talking about, right? Okay, well, think about this. Isn't it good news when dad's proud of you? When dad's pleased with you? You know, a little kid wants dad to be watching their achievements and accomplishments and saying, hey, I'm proud of you. And even adults enjoy having dad recognize what they've accomplished or what they've done. Okay, well, guess who's the real dad? The most important dad is our father in heaven. Isn't it good news that we can actually do stuff that dad likes? I mean, doesn't it feel good to make dad proud? Well, dad up in heaven, our father which is in heaven, you know, we, now that we're saved, we're not at enmity with dad. 
We don't have that enmity between us and the Father which is in heaven, that separation that sin brings. You know, we can please the Father. And you, you say, well, you know, you're talking about me because my dad doesn't approve of anything I do. You know, I'm sorry to hear that. But I've got good news for you. I've got the gospel for you that you've got another father which is in heaven. And you know what? You can, meet, you can please him. Now, you've got to get saved or you can't do anything to please him. Because look, when, when the father in heaven looks down on unsaved people, it doesn't matter what they do. It's a filthy rag. He look, you know, nothing that unsaved people do impresses God the Father where he's like, wow, good job, buddy. He didn't look down at unbelievers and praise them. No, he, he's not impressed with them. But once you get saved, you're in the family. You're his child. And now when you put on the new man, when you walk in the spirit, when you crucify the flesh, as we talked about on Wednesday night, and, and mortify the flesh, you know, you can start doing some stuff that God likes. And it feels good to know, hey, God's pleased with me. God's happy with me. I did something that he told me to do. And he's up in heaven saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That feels good. That's a good news, right? So, when, so, so all of Christ's commandments not to sin, all of Christ's teachings about overcoming sin and 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 denying self, and just the very presence of the Holy Spirit to help us, the, the, the new man living inside of us. This is all good news. And the greatest news of all is that the temptations we struggle with, the sin that we struggle with now, one day we're never going to have to mess with that again because once we get to heaven, we'll never sin again. We won't have any of these temptations anymore. And it'll just be uh, easy sailing from there. Isn't that good news? So we don't want to limit the good news. Look at uh, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy while we're there. I'm, I'm just finishing up showing you a couple highlights here. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So okay, there's no question that the death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel. But it's when you try to say, well, that's it. Well, you, then you get into some dangerous doctrine. Now you're saying, oh, there's other gospels or oh, crazy stuff. And then uh, let's go, let's close in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. Isaiah chapter 40. While you're turning there, I'll read you some good stuff from Hebrews here. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 16 says, For some when they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Who's the them? The children of Israel that left Egypt with Moses that we just read about at the end of Hebrews 3. He said, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Even the ones who God was angry with, where his wrath was kindled and his fire burnt among them. You remember in the book of Numbers where God's just wiping people out? You know, he just kills 23,000 people in one day. I mean, he's just the fire of the Lord's burning among them. He sends his pestilence. God is angry with those people. His fire is burning among them. But what does it say in Hebrews 4? He said, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. So was the gospel preached even unto the most disobedient, wicked person that came out of Egypt with Moses? Yeah, the gospel was preached unto them. Howbeit, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Does everybody get that? So the gospel is for everybody. The gospel gets preached even to the most wicked person, but if it's not mixed with faith in the hearer, it does, it's unprofitable to them. It doesn't do you any good but you can still preach the gospel of, hey, Christ died for us, according to the scriptures. He was wounded for our transgressions. You could say that to anybody on this planet, and it's a true statement. There are 7.4 billion people. You can say to any one of them, Christ died for you, and you'll be telling the truth. The Calvinists can't preach the gospel. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, O Zion, that bringest what? Good tidings. That's what? The gospel. 
right? Gospel means good tidings. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. By the way, it's a great scripture on the deity of Christ because we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one that's going to come. The gospel is the coming of Christ. The Bible says of Jesus, Behold, I come quickly, my reward's with me. What does it say here? His reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Who's that? Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The Bible calls Jesus in Hebrews that great shepherd of the sheep. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. The coming of Jesus Christ to be that good shepherd. The coming of Christ. Behold, the Lord your God comes. That's the gospel message that Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And if he can save the chief, he can save the Indians, right? And he said in verse 9, O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. Lift up thy voice with strength. Be not afraid. Look, what's the moral of the story? If we know the gospel, let's preach it as loud as we can. Amen. Let's shout it from the housetops. Let's preach it on the mountaintops. You want to know why a lot of churches are super weak on soul winning or don't have any soul winning at all? You want to know why certain churches, certain denominations, certain crowds just don't evangelize? I'll tell you why. Because step one to being a great soul winner is being firm on what the gospel even is. And when you got a person who's a little mixed up on what it takes to get to heaven, how are they going to be an effective soul winner? If you got a person who's truly saved, I mean, they believed on Jesus Christ by faith, they've got all their faith and trust and salvation, but then they start getting mixed up into like a, you know, what does repent of your sins mean? And maybe they get a little bit off on that and, and get a little bit screwed up on that or they start doubting their own salvation. I mean, look, believers doubt their salvation all the time. It doesn't mean that they're not saved. Some people, especially when they get out of church, they're not reading the Bible, they're not praying, they're not walking in the Spirit and they start doubting, am I even saved? You think that person's going to be an effective soul winner when they're doubting their own salvation? Or when they're starting to think, oh, I'm not, you know, is, is faith enough? I mean, you know, what's this repentance thing? And they get all screwed up from all these camp meeting type preachers and all this, you know, there's got to be a change and you got to get, you got to turn from sin or you got to at least be willing to turn from sin. Well, at least you got to be willing to be willing <laughs> to be willing to turn from sin. Right. How willing is willing? So willing that you will. You know, I've heard that. You don't have to do it but you just have to be willing to do it. And the way that we know you were willing is that you did it. <laughs> but you have to do it. How are you going to be an effective soul winner with all that confusion in your heart and all that confusion in your mind? You know what you'll find? The churches that are rock solid on, we know what the gospel is. We know what salvation is. We know what it takes to get to heaven. Man, I could tell you in my sleep how to be saved. You know, Amazing, those are the ones going out and doing effective soul winning. Why? Because in order to do effective soul winning, you got to do what? You got to get up into the high mountain. Number one, you got to get out there and go somewhere. The feet of the gospel. But number two, you got to lift up your voice with strength. You can't give a weak message saying like, I mean, it, it seems like if you just believe on Christ, I mean, it seems like I guess that's what you have to do to get to heaven. I mean, that's kind of what this verse looks like it's saying. That's not lifting up the voice with strength with the gospel, right? It's got to be, no, no, no. There's no doubt. It's believe, faith. Look at all these verses. It's so clear. Look at that. Let me show you another verse, another verse. Clear, clear, clear. You got to send a strong message, a clear message. Now, obviously, I'm not saying to be loud or belligerent at somebody's door and get in their face. It's, it's believe, you know, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that behind the pulpit, it is appropriate to scream out the word believe to 300 people. Yeah. That makes sense. But when you get to the door, you know, obviously we're not talking about shouting or getting in people's face because that's not appropriate in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, we don't see Jesus doing that with the woman on well. You don't see him hopping on the well and, <laughs> and shouting or anything. You know, obviously use your brain in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But when you're in that one-on-one -on -one conversation, the strength still needs to be there of 
this is the truth, not maybe, not I hope so, I think so. You know, a clear message, a strong message. And then the, the last thing he said there that's important, uh, he said, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Now again, if you're a little bit watered down on the gospel, a little confused on the gospel, a little mixed up on the gospel, you know what? You're going to be a little bit afraid too. Boldness comes with being sure that you're right. You know, if a pastor's not even sure that he's right about something, he's not going to preach it boldly. Now, every once in a while, there are scriptures where, you know, I struggle to be sure that I'm right about that interpretation, you know, on secondary issues. And sometimes when I get up to preach on those chapters that I'm a little iffy on, I'll even make statements like, you know, I'm not 100% sure about this. But here's what I think this means. You know, I'm just being honest. You come to certain things and, you know, you're not as firm on it. Well, that better not be the gospel, though. Not, you know, now, I'm not 100% sure how we're going to make it into heaven, folks. I mean, it's time to get a new church at that point. So there are going to be times when we're not as sure about things. And you know what? Those messages are not as strong of a message. The strong message is when it's rock solid, it's airtight, it's fact. And we've got all the evidence right here. There's no doubt, no question. And then you can get up unafraid and preach with boldness. And you don't care if the whole church gets up and walks out. Why? Because you know you're right. Yeah, that's good. You know you're right. But see, if you don't know you're right, you're not going to be that confident. You are going to be a little afraid. Oh, man, I hope I'm teaching this right. So step one to being an effective soul winner is hammering down the gospel in your own heart. And even people that are saved can sometimes later get a little bit doubtful or confused and everything, and, and, and bad preaching will do that to you. We need to get firm on this, and then once, we, once we're firm on this thing, and we know that we're saved, and we know we're going to heaven, and we understand the gospel, then it's time to get out there and do what? Get it to the whole world. Shout it to the whole world. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the good news, and, and that the key component of the good news is for us. Thank you for doing it for us. Thank you for making it available for us, Lord. And we just pray that you would help us to preach the gospel to as many people as we can, and it's good news, Lord. Help us to, to get this good news to people that are in dire need of hearing it. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.